So, um, evolution of uh, high strength automotive fields is what I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about. And I'm also going to hint, uh, um, hint uh, give some hints about how the future is unfolding. Um, so, mobility itself has gone through um, sea change, if, if, if you may say. Um, much of much of uh, mobility in the past used to be on the sea, uh, through ships and on the ground would be horse-drawn carriages. And of course, with the advent of, um, of, of advent of steam, we have the steam mobility, not only not not only on on rails, but there was steam steam mobility on roads as well. Twentieth century saw a major shift, a major uh, shift in the way people moved from place A to place B. Um, remember, at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, it was still ships. And of course, at the end of this 20th century, we were big time into Dreamliners and, um, and the Boeing 737s. First, take, take a, give or take a few, few years, right? Um, and, and, the, and the ground mobility was, was uh, dominated by the IC, the, in the, uh, the combustion in, internal combustion engines, and um, uh, and we saw the first hint of uh, mobility becoming electric. And as we move forward into the 21st century mobility 4.0, uh, we are clearly seeing the unidirectional movement of mobility into electric, into shared, uh, and into autonomous. Um, not necessarily in that sequence, but the trend is very, very clear. Um, shared mobility has happened and is going to happen more and more. Electric mobility is happening and autonomous technologies are already there. It's a matter of getting um, the, the right regulations in place uh, and enough number of uh, vehicles on the roads and the, uh, the signages, et cetera, the, the whole infrastructure to be more robust, but it's going to happen. So um, the mobility we will see in the next decade or couple of decades will be vastly, vastly different from the mobility we have seen over the last two decades, right? Um, given this scenario, um, what is the impact on materials? And what is impacting materials? So today, as we look um, at the uh, mobility or the auto automobile scenario, the biggest thing that is impacting materials choice in, in automotive is CO2. It's, 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 um, it, it is sustainability, right? So out of the, out of the 49 or 50 gigatons of CO2 that, that, is, um, that, that is emitted, man-made CO2 that is emitted in the world, uh, roughly 10% roughly is emitted from the roadside, that is, um, the vehicles that are flying on the road, right? The heavy duty, that's commercial vehicles or even light duty vehicles and, and passenger cars, and which amounts to roughly 70% of all transportation. So this is a huge, huge impact. And this is primarily the reason for transition that we see in mobility, both in terms of, um, in terms of choice of energy and also choice of materials in the car. In, 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 the, in the vehicle. And this is what is the result of all that CO2 emission, where, we are, where the ground-based vehicles are emitting about five gigatons of CO2 every year. And that is not the way forward. If regulations already in place in US um, and the most strict in, the, in Europe and also um, in Japan and progressively coming in in China and India, uh, which is driving down the permitted amount of CO2 that um, a fleet of vehicles can emit or, allow, or are allowed to emit um, at, the, at the tailpipe. Um, so this is coming down from, say, if I look at uh, if I look at China, for example, the regulation was 172 in 2015. It's come down to 70 that is allowed, and it's come down to 93. Will go down to 70. Um, and similarly, all the other nations that you see in this chart, I'm not going to read it out, uh, are becoming stricter and stricter in their norms uh, of what would be allowed as emission at the tailpipe. Right? And the result of this is um, all automakers need to go either 
um, well, it's not an either. They will need to go towards um, greener energy source and they would need to reduce waste. And there are, um, there are only a few ways that you can reduce waste. You can use uh, lightweight materials. Um, you can use um, steels that are stronger and therefore you can use thinner gauges and therefore make them light. You can use materials that are um, in inherently lower density, aluminum, mag magnesium, et cetera, or you can go to non-metallics uh, such as composites, polymeric composites. There's also something you can do in the structural. So you can design new structures, you can replace solid elements with the hollow elements, uh, so and so forth. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about it later, uh, just touch upon it. And, um, and of course, the whole production process can be optimized so that you can um, make, things, uh, make things lighter and reduce cost through, um, through uh, you know, reducing, reducing number of joints parts consolidation, et cetera. All of this results in weight reduction and all of these uh, in various combinations are used by, uh, by the automakers to achieve um, the desired level of um, weight reduction for a particular uh, cost bracket for a particular level of, um, level of uh, CO2 emission. So let us see what um, steel has done in response to, to the ever strict, uh, ever uh, ever tightening measure on, on CO2. So of course the direction has been high strength steels, right? So th that's the best way we know, but there are other ways that we know also. But it's the best way we know, the most convenient way we know to reduce weight, which is make steel stronger. And therefore you can use thinner sections and make the car lighter, right? But as, as this graph shows, and as we all know here, I'm not going to, uh, I'm just reaching to the converted. Steels, uh, like many other materials, follow the banana curve, uh, where the stronger you make the steel, the lower its ductility becomes. Yeah. So in conventional high string steels, uh, you, can, so you can start with um, high elongation, high ductility, interstitial free grade IF, and you can move up through various combinations of chemistry and, uh, and processing to, HS, to the high strength, uh, low alloy steels, but strength increases, but then you sacrifice elongation. Of course, you can't sacrifice elongation in making a car because you need to make deep draws, uh, you, need to, you need to make them uh, stretchable, et cetera. So um, over the, you know, this was prevalent in 1960s, 70s, over the next couple of decades, people started working on microstructure uh, to be able to move up um, in elongation at any, at any, at any um, strength level. So then you got the first generation high strength steels, which were the dual phase steels, and you had a combination of microstructures, you have the transformation induced steels and the complex microstructure steels, which elevate um, um, just beyond your, the, the base level of uh, conventional high strength steels. So with the trip at the same level of strength, uh, you get higher elongation. But this was never enough, right? The Dil Mange more and the whole steel fraternity got together and they said, we need to beat the banana. And the beating the banana happened with the second generation high strength steels uh, developed over a period. And you know this combination of first generation and second generation steels were essentially the result of massive inter international collaboration of about 30 steel companies and a few automotive companies under the OLSAP, OLSAC and subsequent um, international programs uh, for developing steels and to beat the threat posed by low density materials. And um, so over this, over this decade of 90, 90s and the first decade of 2000, we got the, trip, the twin induced plasticity steels, uh, essentially uh, one played around with the, uh, with the stacking fault energy through alloying additions to microstructure um, so that um, you, know, you, know, you, could, you could induce, you, your plasticity came from twinning uh, and you had very strong uh, boundaries uh, which gave, gave strength as well as the twinning gave you the, um, the, uh, the ductility. 
of course um, you know when you when you are at these high levels of complex phases and and of course it needed multiple uh, alloying elements which you wouldn't uh, which you wouldn't use earlier uh, not very popular among steel makers of course i mean this created problems in casting created problems in recycling uh, created problems in coating etc so one had to take a middle path and of course came the third generation high strength steel right in the middle here um, uh, which were uh, which are more recent ones you know, french and parchin steel and the medium manganese steels um, so this is in general how the steel um, uh, development has the high strength steel development has happened over the last say 50 years Right. So my talk is over. I, have, I, I promised you I will talk about evolution of steel, but of course, um, I, I will not leave you here. I will go deeper down uh, into each of these and show you what exactly had happened without boring you too much. And also look, look at the future uh, with, a, with a, a gloss over some of the directions in the future. So conventional high strength steels, as you all know, strength was derived through precipitation uh, to precipitation or through brain refinement, right? And, and these were achieved through a combination of alloying elements, um, very fine, that gave very fine carbides or nitrides, um, and um, clever rolling schedules, which, which controlled uh, crystallization and therefore uh, controlled the, grains, uh, the, the grain size as one came out of the finishing mill and, um, and into the rollout table I'm talking about hot strip only, right? And, uh, and so therefore you've got the uh, strength to either of these uh, mechanisms. In the first generation steels, that was not enough. You needed to get to higher, um, higher elongation at the same strength. And this was achieved through tailoring the microstructure. Um, and that was achieved through endocritic, endocritical uh, treatment of the steel where you are you're starting material before rolling itself um, was in the intercritical region. You have, um, you have a combination of phases and the, those two phases evolve separately and you have uh, a holding period in the, it, it, after the finished rolling uh, or you can do a controlled cooling, whatever. Uh, there were, of course, different courses for different horses um, and you could essentially got a combination of ferrite, martensite, you've got a combination of ferrite, bainite, uh, and each of these gave you um, different, pro slightly different properties, right? Um, presence of um, many of these, you had austenite present, especially in trip steel, and this slide, especially on, on trip, where um, you have the austenite present, which gave you ductility. And of course, um, because of the deformation during um, during, say, a crash, right? Um, the, the austenite, which is unstable at room temperature, would transform into martensite, giving strength during during the deformation, such as a crash, and giving that component, which is made out of a trip steel, better crash resistance. Right. So, combination of um, um, of, of microstructures through um, clever micro alloying, uh, clever alloying, and um, and clever heat treatment scheduled during uh, pre and during rolling uh, gave us a combination of uh, of, of these steels. And uh, um, so I, I'm not talking about the dual phases and etc. So let, let's jump to let's jump to the second second generation, which was the, the cherry on top of the banana or beating the banana. So this was uh, TWIP, which is twin induced plastic, plasticity steel. People were aiming at a figure which was a multiplication of strength and ductility. So, for example, if, if there was a steel with 1000 megapascal strength and 5% ductility, you had a steel, they would define that steel as a 5000 megapascal percent, right? And they would be aiming with, with the second generation steel somewhere around 15,000 to 20,000 megapascal strength. And then you result. Uh, into completely different microstructure regimes and, and, and mechanism regimes, such as TWIP, which um, needed to have, you needed to play with the stacking fault energy, as I said, so that twin is induced. Um, and typically, you would achieve it by high manganese, 
Um, and the result would be, as you can see here, thousand or more megapascal in strength, anywhere close to 40% elongation. So you would end up with uh, above 40,000 megapascal percent in terms of uh, strength elongation combination of the of these steels. But these are very high alloy content. Welding is a pain. Even casting and rolling uh, are not very uh, user friendly. So therefore, one would, um, I'll skip this slide. Uh, there was therefore the need to get into the third generation, which is a trade-off between the high um, uh, strength elongation combination of the second generation and the lower strength elongation combination of the first generation, somewhere in the middle. And um, QNP was born, which is again, um, a clever partitioning, clever combination of, alloy, of uh, clever use of alloys and the rolling schedules to make uh, two, two different phases uh, possible uh, before rolling and then to allow uh, with through, through holding times, carbon and alloys to partition into a different phase. And during cooling, you get a pre-formed martensite and then a retained austenite, which would transition later into very fine uh, martensite or, or, or bainite, depending on what the cooling conditions and uh, other conditions are. Um, Completely new lines were set up to make these make this sort of rolling possible and these and these uh, and and these uh, microstructures possible. Uh, medium manganese steels are still being developed. So this is work in continuation, um, which is which is emanated from multiple uh, industry academia partnerships um, and uh, led led essentially by. Uh, um, Colorado School of Mines, um, also in, uh, in, in Germany and in Aachen. Um, multiple um, papers have uh, come out of this and uh, there's a leadership in, in, this, in, in the third generation steel uh, that has resulted in completely new uh, ways of thinking about high strength steels in automotive, right? But there is a problem in all of these all of these steels, all of these first, second, third generation steels. Although we can, we have made through, through um, sacrificing and playing around um, with chemistry and, and, and rolling control, um, we have managed to get uh, reasonable amounts of, um, tolerable amounts of alloying elements. We have managed to get castability, rollability um, high, higher than say, uh, say TWIP. Um, even compatibility, but the coating process itself is, is, is a problem still, right? Um, can you imagine if you take a uniform microstructure steel and you want to coat it, you will dip it in, um, uh, in, 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 hot, in, in hot zinc and it will come out coated. There is not much change to the microstructure. Not these steels, all these microstructure manipulative steels um, need to be designed separately, both in their chemistry and definitely in their rolling parameters, if they have to be coated eventually, right? So there is, um, there is an added, uh, there's an additional level of complexity in these steels where the coating process modifies the microstructure itself, and you can use the coating process to generate this microstructure, and you need to do that to get this sort of microstructure in the coated condition. So, what you can get in hot, or what you can get in the hot band, which is after hot rolling, will not result in what you get after coat after coating if you use the same steel, right? Because it goes through heat, heat treatment, and you lose the uh, microstructure and, and the mechanical properties. So. Hot rolled microstructure, cold rolled as received microstructure, and coated as received microstructure. If you want to remain, if you want to get um, this sort of microstructure with this sort of properties, you need to start at different chemistry and with different rolling schedules. With that sort of a complication in mind, uh, people have developed 
a different route to get to high STEM skills, which is the whole problem comes because um, uh, the, the, you need to you need to form this. You, the steel needs to be soft when formed, and the steel needs to be strong in use to prevent uh, to give safety during crash. Okay. Now, what if you form a steel when it is hot? When the steel is hot, its ductility is high. You can form it easily. And when you quench it or cool it, it should get into a microstructure after forming, which will be inherently strong in use. So it's easy to conceive, difficult to do. Um, but then we have the press hardening steels uh, with the boron addition in it. And um, one of the large, one of the largest steel companies in the world has a have been working on this for the last two decades and has a strong, strong grasp of, of this area. Um, where you take uh, 22 mm B type of, type of steel and you heat it to austenizing temperatures, bring it into, uh, into a press, you form it in a press when it is hot and you cool it in the press um, and it, it retains the shape, phase transformation happens, um, martensite forms and you take it out and you let it cool down to room temperature. And that, and that and what you get is a, is, a, is a product or a component that has been formed at a high temperature when it is ductile. And what you get out of the press is, uh, is, 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 the, is the same component that is hard after cooling and being cooled in the press, formed and cooled in the press. And of course, there, is, um, there are associated um, problems with that. The problem is mostly is um, you're, you're keeping this material at high temperature for some time, it will form scales. Um, and of course, descaling needs to happen. Sometimes the scales are difficult to move once a component is formed. Um, so that's, um, that gives a, a, an undesirable mark or defect on the surface of a component that you don't want or the automaker doesn't want. Therefore, you need to coat it. Of course, um, zinc coating is, is, uh, or has been difficult um, because at high temperature, zinc penetrates and creates um, uh, creates brittleness on the subsurface. Um, so the, the solution has been aluminium, um, uh, an aluminized uh, coating, which, which um, again is a pro is, is proprietary and, and therefore um, is not uh, very easily available to everyone else in the world. So there's a search on for the right sort of coating. But there's also a search on to avoid coating altogether, which I'm going to talk about a little later. So this is where the world is in, in terms of um, development in steel. And um, this is uh, one of the, just, you know, the ways in which um, the press hardened steels are used in multiple um, components. And uh, this is the data from the uh, future vehicle concept where, which shows press hardening steel as one of the most, uh, most high growth areas amongst all high strength steels being used in automotive. This is a generic figure because it, the, the nature of growth will vary from model to model. But in general, press hardened steels uh, are growing fast in, its, uh, in their use. Let's uh, touch upon um, what are the competitors for steel? And they're not standing still. So let's look at aluminum, right? Aluminum is, uh, has always been a competitor and one of our one of the Tata Group companies, uh, Jaguar, is uh, um, is quite prone to using aluminium uh, because they are uh, they, they, you know, in legacy. They have been good aluminium uh, auto designers, and they remain so. And they prefer aluminium to uh, to steel. Um, but then, as we go into uh, go into lighter demand for lighter bodies by electric vehicles. Um, the demand for aluminium has has increased, um, and as you, as you can see in this picture, and in this graph, the uh, volume share of aluminium has uh, uh, has increased over the last few years, and is uh, is uh, predicted to increase as as we go in, and it's uh, and it's in all sorts of vehicles. It's in Fiat, it's in uh, it's in Ford, it's in uh, the Ford 150, which is in the bottom bottom right. Uh, the whole um, open part of the of the truck on the on the outside is is fully aluminium. 
so that's been sort of a trailblazer for aluminium over the last five, six years. If you look at polymers, um, which has uh, as about one sixth the density of steel and even uh, composites used in, in ba based on polymers uh, would, be, would be extremely light. They are corrosion resistant and, and, uh, and very high formability because they are soft when formed. So a lot of things going for polymer, polymer based composites are the polymers themselves. Um, and as you can, uh, as we can see in this picture, this is of course the use of CFRP, which is carbon fiber based uh, based um, uh, composites uh, in automotive parts. Um, multiple companies have experimented with uh, carbon fiber based parts with um, or carbon fiber composite based parts uh, in hoods, in um, in chassis, and various other components as as shown here. Even BMW has uh, experimented with the whole body with carbon fiber. Cost is high. And until carbon fiber becomes more um, reasonable in cost, and imagine if we are talking about one sixth the density, therefore it's quite light. So it doesn't really have to come down to steel's cost per ton. It can still be twice or even three times the cost of steel per ton, and it still will be viable, but it is today about 10 times higher. Right. So as um, as the as the price of these materials come down, they will become suddenly more viable uh, as as um, choice materials going forward. Today, glass fiber based composites are uh, are almost there. Um, with with increasing volume of use, the prices have come down. You will not find, I think, today a single car whose bumper is not glass fiber reinforced polymer composite whose fender, which is uh, uh, the, the part that is just over the front wheels, um, are all polymeric. So polymers have made inroads into, into, auto, into the uh, auto body as we speak today. But steel is fighting back. It's not standing still. And I was talking about, um, talking about the press forming steels and uh, uh, the hot stamp grades. And the major problem with the hot stamp grades being the scaling and um, there's only a very few options available for coating that good coating those steels to prevent the scaling. Now, every company is trying to look at ways by which the scaling can be reduced, either through a different coating or through some clever uh, change in the process the process parameters. So, we have worked with uh, with Imperial College. Um, one of our uh, researchers did his PhD on this subject. Um, uh, where uh, you, you change the transfer time and you change the, the you, you cool the press the, 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 the component down or the sheet down to uh, 500 degrees centigrade and then then you press it um, and this is done very quickly so that the scale thickness doesn't doesn't grow and and uh, when you when you're holding under the press from a low temperature um, the scales don't grow grow very thick they are very fine and uh, they are much more easier to remove. Um, and also sometimes you don't even need to remove them, right? So um, there are, so this is one direction in which uh, companies are moving and steel research is moving to avoid, um, avoid, uh, it avoid the surface issues related to uh, hot stamping. There are other uh, technologies that are coming in and this is about uh, hollow sections in, in automotive uh, many times, the um, in order to reduce uh, reduce weight uh, of hollow sections, you need to use different diameters and different thicknesses at different parts. And these are, um, you know, getting these together used to be a very expensive and cumbersome process, either through tailor roll uh, rolling or through tailor welded blanks. But um, uh, you know, clever research uh, has um, has resulted in a continuously variable thickness in tubes, uh, which is patented by, uh, by, by, by Tata Steel and is now being uh, tested um, at, at some of the uh, automakers. So steel doesn't stand still um, in the face of competition from other materials. Uh, while there is, um, as I've showed you, there is movement in the direction of clever processing in the, in the hot strip mill, in the cold rolling mill and coating to get to newer and newer microstructures and uh, and strength ductility combinations there is also 
effort going on in, in the, in the post-processing of the steel, starting from a simple microstructure, therefore easy to make and lower in cost, to get to components that are tailored um, to be lightweight in use. And that needs new uh, manufacturing technologies, um, such as the two I've described here. So in conclusion, um, I think I've kept the time. In conclusion, um, I would like to say that development in uh, high strength steels has been driven uh, by uh, for the, uh, the, the need to reduce weight and have safety performance and cost. And the future appears to be much more multi-material with steel, aluminum, composites, polymers coexisting. Um, um, and then of course, steel is not standing still and it is fighting back through novel uh, processing and um, novel microstructures. Thank you very much. I hope uh, um, this was instructive and useful for you.